Hello. So we've changed the mock-up a little bit so that it works a little bit better. We're still going to have to change it a lot later on. It's still just a mock-up. But let's take the first steps at turning it into an actual game sort of situation. We're going to create a new script called Combatant, and this is just going to be every kind of battle participating unit. Open it up. There is a version of Visual Studio you can use now. Uh, there is a Unity-specific Visual Studio package which is definitely better than MonoDevelop, but I'm going to continue using MonoDevelop because that's what I started in for this project. The most important thing at this stage is we need to have it, these characters pop up on our queue properly. So therefore, what we're going to do is we are going to come up with this standard of action units per minute, which is basically a speed measure. The oh, I need to put in a a value here. A float is fine. The whole point of this is that if you can count up, there's no cap, no maximum. Whereas if we were counting down, you hit zero and things get sticky. So rather than having a delay built into each character, we have a recovery built into each character, and then their moves will cause a specific amount of delay. That'll work great for most of our causes, and that's uh, the first half of what we need. Now we're going to be doing the exact same thing that we did uh, with our inventory system. We're going to have a data object, and then we're going to have some display objects. But the mapping is a little bit more complex. Rather than having an inventory item and then an inventory item display, we're actually going to have to have several displays associated with each character. So first things first, we'll need the UI collection and then we are going to go ahead and specify some images. Later on we're going to want to change this battle sprite to a full-fledged battle display class, an actual you know image class of some kind that could do layered sprites and animations. We're not anywhere near that point yet though so this is fine. The other thing we're going to want to do is that little icon that pops up in our queue. So public queue uh, visual queue visual oh look it turned red for once in its life monodevelop has detected something correctly there is nothing called a queue visual there we are now we've got a queue visual so these queue visuals don't actually need to have any functionality at the moment. We'll go back and put functionality in them later. But what we really need to do at the right this second is go down into the battle queue and make one of these into our prefab, and the rest of them can go away. So we're going to create a new prefab group. There we are. Go into that directory and uh, drop this battler in. But we're going to name it a queue visual, and we're going to put the queue visual onto it and drop it into our prefabs. There we are. We now have a queue visual. Now, we're probably going to want to have a different prefab for each character. The other option is that we can have just the sprite unique to each character and have a generic queue visual. That sounds good and it would be a way I, it, it would it would be something that would work, except if I want to have a unique visual for each kind of character and monster, that might get in my way. For example, I'm going to want to change both the mask and the overlay field that doesn't actually exist yet for a lot of different kinds of things. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe there are different factions of enemies and the spider faction has like a webbed overlay and stuff like that. It's a lot easier to just save the entire visual rather than piecemeal saving the various sprites that you're going to need in order to create the visual. So with that in mind, we're going to go and create a bunch of these and each one of them is going to reflect a different character. Oh, portraits are there. So this one is going to be P character 2. This one is going to be P character 3. And this one is going to be the monster. We'll name them all. So this one will be uh, our QV Frog Samurai.
and then this one is going to be QV um, X Lady. I'm sort of thinking about a storyline, but I haven't really thought up anything. These are just placeholder characters. So this will be QV Yellow Mage. And this one was going to be QV Bird Skeleton. There we are. So now those are all embedded as prefabs. And we can go over into our heroes and drop those prefabs in. But we don't actually have any hero prefabs for these characters yet. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Let's just create a new empty game object and we will call it Frog Samurai. And we will just drop a script on and uh, get to work here. Um, oh, is it not image? Is it sprite? Yeah, that's fine. There we go. And then we will save that into prefab. Uh, let's go ahead and create a new directory or two here. If we actually get very far uh, into the game world, then we are going to end up creating lots and lots and lots of these. So it's good to separate them out right away. Here's our Frog Samurai. And then let's create another duplicate here, which we will call Axe Lady. Create another duplicate, which we will call Yellow Mage. And one more for our bird skeleton friends. We're going to go ahead and put uh, an E underscore in front of them so that we understand that these are enemies. Uh, later on, we'll refine this. Ah, there you are. And drop that into our prefabs. There we go. So now we've got our four dis we we got our four data prefabs the four characters that exist in the game world now exist in our queue, in, sorry, in our uh, files. So now we have actual data about them. And then we also have their visualizations for the bar down here. Let's just go ahead and make sure that everything works as planned so far by just dropping in stuff into the battle queue. And you can see how it pops up quite nicely. So what we need to do is we need to make it so that there is some kind of battle control system that understands which combatants exist and just goes through them looking for whoever's turn it is next. This can be a little bit complex uh, depending on whether or not we instantiate all of the combatants. And I want to get this out right away. I want to talk about this right now before we get any further. Right now these are in the game world. All of these combatants are physical objects in Unity space. Now they're not they're not appearing on our game world because they're invisible. They have no no graphics associated with them, but they are instantiated. And that means that if we were to change any of these values, like say change our bird down to 60, it would not change the core prefab. So if we drop another bird skeleton in, this one's going to have 100. See? That's important because we have two basic options. We can either choose to make our data objects prefab only, or we can choose to instantiate them. 
There are advantages to both paths, but in this case I think it's better if we instantiate them because it allows us for a lot more flexibility when we're facing a large number of nearly identical enemies. Uh, if we were using these bird skeletons, for example, uh, these bird skeletons, there are nine of them, and if we are actually re referencing a prefab when we talk about them, we'll have to come up with some way to track their hit points individually and all sorts of stuff like that. It's, um, it'd be a big pain. So instead, it's much easier if we instantiate their stats and just work with them in the game world. Uh, it is a little bit more heavyweight, and it does require some juggling of instantiate and destroy commands, but all in all, I think it's going to be a lot easier. So, even though there are no visuals attached to these battle objects, to these combat unit objects, they are still going to exist in the game world as instantiated objects. Which leads us to how we're going to track them. Since we actually are planning to instantiate them, we can use start to keep track of them. We're going to need to add our generic collections so that we can use the list class. So because it's static, it is a class object, a class uh, property rather than a rather than an object property, and everyone can access it. And all we need to do is add ourselves to it. But we do have to remember that when we go away, we want to unadd ourselves. Now we may need something more complex than this because a lot of times when you kill something you don't want it to immediately vanish off the face of the earth. You want it to leave behind a, a corpse or whatever. Um, we're gonna go ahead and deal with that later. For now this will work fine. Because of this we are going to go ahead and just add in a little bit of a log so that we can keep track of what's going on. Debug.log uh, combatant plus name plus is active. And now, if we go over to the console, and we hit play, combatant is active, combatant is active, combatant is active, uh, you notice that this is a single object rather than nine. That's because we didn't create nine bird skeleton combatants. Although there are nine bird skeletons currently on display, these are placeholder graphics. We have not connected the combatants to the graphics. I think that's going to have to wait until next episode. Uh, since we're already 12 minutes in. But just to recap real quick, we just created hero objects, or rather combatant objects, to set up our data flow. The, these objects keep track of whether they are currently active in combat, and it's very easy for us to track all of the active combatants, no matter when they pop into existence or leave. Uh, so we don't have to worry about things getting messy or dirty if new enemies come into the game world. Or new heroes. And uh, we've also gone ahead and turned our objects down here into prefabs, which we can associate with each character individually. Obviously, in the next episode, we will be filling this place up with those prefabs, but we're not quite ready to do that. So, uh, next episode.